So yes, we're very, very happy to have Tobias Ekholm um, speaking, um, telling us about skein module curve counts and recursion. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, a, a, it's great to uh, speak in this seminar and uh, it's great to see so many people around from everywhere actually. So, so uh, maybe a few of you have heard parts of this talk uh, before, but then, then apologies, but I think there will be some kind of new pieces for everyone. So uh, let's see. So what, what I'm gonna talk about uh, is report on sort of several joint projects um, with, with Shendek, uh, Kosharski, Longi, uh, Penka Georgia and, and Lenny. And so the main uh, starting point for all these uh, projects is somehow this skein valued uh, curve count. So skein valued open Gromit invariants. And so I'm, I'm gonna go over that uh, briefly. And then uh, I'm gonna show you in some kind of simple example that this is actually fairly useful and, and, and you can actually count curves in this way by, by approaching things from infinity. And, um, and then uh, towards the end, I'm, I'm gonna try to apply this perspective and tell you a little bit about how it looks like these curves, in particular for not conormals, come organized in some kind of version of uh, Gupa Komovafa um, conjectures and so on. So, so, um, so let me let me start and and, and give you the geometric setting. So, so we, we're going to work in the setting of a, a three-dimensional symplectic Caravia. Um, so, and, and it's not gonna be very strange manifold. So you, you, you all know them. It's, it's the complex three space, cotangent bundle of S3, and then the resolved conifold. And inside this space, we're gonna have a, a Maslow zero Lagrangian. And again, the main examples are kind of a, a well known to everybody. It's somehow the toric brain uh, in, in the conifold, not conormals. And maybe also the zero section in T star S3. So, so there's sort of no, no very exotic uh, Lagrangians either. Um, and what we are going to do is we are going to count polymorphic curves like in Gromov Witten uh, theory. So, uh, in particular, uh, we, we fix some almost complex structure on this uh, Calabiao that is compatible with the uh, symplectic form. And then the holomorphic curves are as, as usual maps from Riemann surface into the space, taking boundary to Lagrangian and, and the, 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 uh, they should solve the kosher riemann equation. And so uh, the main point with this Calabiao uh, three and so on is that if you look at this dimension formula, so, so the, the kosher riemann equation is Fred Holm equation, so you would expect some finite dimensional uh, moduli space and, and, and doing the index formula, you can actually compute the dimension of that space and, and the formula is stated there. It's, it's the dimension of the space, the complex dimension of the ambient space, minus three times all the characteristic plus some uh, uh, churn class contribution. And here is the relative churn class related to this Maslow, Maslow index of the Lagrangian. And so in this case, it's zero times something plus zero. So in particular, all the holomorphic curves are formally rigid. And that suggests that you should be able to count them. So they form some, some zero dimensional moduli space. And, and so uh, it's a bunch of points, possibly with rational weights because of some automorphism and so on, but, but let's pretend this is really manifold, maybe not orbifold. So then, then it's a bunch of points and you can count them with signs. And, and that would be the counterpart in when you have closed curves that actually actually works like that. And that gives you the Gromov with an invariant. So you, you count in various homology classes, various genus and so on. Now for, for open curves, this is somehow some well-known problems with this count. And, and the point is that uh, you would like the count, you can still count, but you would like the count to be invariant under deformations. And in the, in the closed curve case, uh, you get an invariant count because the, 
the nodal curves that appear, they appear in co-dimension two. So you know, if, if you have a broken curve, you somehow you have two parameters nearby, the, the length of the gluing neck and the twist parameter. So it's a kind of complex plane. You can think of it like, like equation x, y is equal epsilon, where epsilon is a complex parameter. And, and the broken curve is at epsilon zero, so co-dimension two. In the real case, we should replace the epsilon by a real parameter. And you see that the breaking is somehow happening in co-dimension one. And in particular, naive curve counts will never be invariant. So, so the picture on this slide is indicating um, what happens. So, so, so on the left there is drawn some hypothetical situation where you have maybe two holomorphic disks on a, on a Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is somehow the background three-dimensional space. And, and, and here we see the two boundaries of the holomorphic disk and they link. And then maybe you deform the complex structure or deform Lagrangian and things start moving around. And at some point, uh, the two boundaries, the holomorphic curves cross. And at that point, of course, the disks, I mean, they, nothing very much happens with the disk individually, they just pass through. But as they pass through, you can glue them up to a new disk. And so on one side of this wall, there somehow the count would be two, and on the other side, it would be three or something like that. So, so whatever happens here, the, the naive count is not going to be invariant. And, and, and in fleur homology and so on, there is, a, there is a, some kind of, a, of course, many methods to deal with these like bounding chains and so on. And, and, and here we are going to uh, take a slightly different perspective. And we're going to try to show that this, this count of curves is actually invariant if we count the boundaries uh, in the skein module of the, of, the, of the Lagrangian. And that, so, so what we're doing is we're doing an all genus count, but it will require some extra or unusual, uh, unusual features. So, so in order to uh, describe it, I would like to first go over, you know, what is the skein module of a three-dimensional real manifold. And uh, we'll actually use two versions of the skein module. One version is uh, the for open curves when you just have, have a Lagrangian and curves ending there. That's the Humphrey, Humphrey version. And the other version is the Kaufman version, which you can use when the Lagrangian is uh, like uh, RPN and CPN. So it's invariant under some involution. And then somehow the curves also may be invariant under this involution. And, and the thing looks a little bit different. And, and we will use the Kaufman just a little bit um, to illustrate something. Um, so, so, so Homfleet is maybe the main, main player in this talk. So, uh, so let, let me try to explain now what is this skein module. So it's a module over a ring, uh, gen uh, in two variable ring, and we're going to call the variables A and Z. And A is uh, some framing variable and C is some kind of Euler characteristic variable. And sometimes it's uh, customer to, to replace this C by some other variable Q, uh, but let's for now stick to Z and you'll see Q appearing in a bit. So, um, the scan relation is the following. You take all huge kind of collection of things, but you take all isotopic classes of links in the manifold, actually framed links and oriented for the, for the home fleet. And then you impose uh, the following relation that you can actually, you can cross over. So that's the first picture to the left. So an overcrossing can be, replaced by an undercrossing plus the splicing at the cost of adding a Z variable, right? So that's the first relation. And uh, then there is a normalization that says that the unknot, so it's the framed planar unknot. So you can think about the little circle as lying in some local coordinates in actually, actually a plane um, bounding a disk. And then that is the, the normalized to have the value A minus A inverse over Z. And finally, there is the cost of a framing change. So somehow it's again a local picture. So you have a little kink on your curve. You can remove it at the cost of, of an A or A inverse, depending on the sign of the crossing you remove. 
And the Kaufman version of this is, is very similar, except that, um, well, the first one, you, you have two, two types of splicing. So you have a, an overcrossing and undercrossing. You, of course, uh, here it's um, slightly uh, different, it's unoriented crossings, but you see, you can relate which resolutions you do by say, walking along the underpath, holding out your left hand, you see which region you should somehow splice. And, and, and so this is one rela relations, and then there is a normalization relation, um, slightly different than, than the Homfly one. And, and the last one is the framing price. And then here you note that even if the link is not really oriented, if you give it an orientation, the sign of this little kink is independent of the orientation because you kind of change, change it back and forth. So we can still talk about this A variable. Okay, now this uh, scan module uh, could be somehow very, very big, but in fact, it's not, it's, it's sort of controllable. So it's a good place to, to count in. For, for the three sphere, for example, the scan module is just the polynomial ring itself. So, so by, uh, which means that by, by these crossing changes and splicings and so on, you can reduce any knot diagram to just a collection of unknots, and then you can, you can use this normalization to, to, to make it a polynomial. In other manifolds, it's not quite that simple. Of course, if, if there is homotopy in the manifold, you cannot remove completely a non-homotopic non, non curve. And uh, for example, for the solid torus, which we will use uh, many times in the talk, uh, this is a free uh, commutative algebra generated by countably many generators, which is somehow some curves that go uh, m times around, uh, m times around backwards. And multiplication is somehow just stacking annuli uh, next to each other. Uh, so, so anyway, so, so basically, if you want, if you want to compare S1 times R2 to S3 in terms of Homfleet polynomials, it's somehow, there is a basis of curves going this and that many times around, and any curve can be expressed as that, that basic curve times a Homfleet polynomial, right? But, but you have to figure out which basic curve it is. In some sense, infinitely many Homfleet polynomials. Okay, so uh, the, <clears throat> the curve counts are a little bit different and I, I will try to describe how in a bit, but let me first sort of state it. So the, the main difference is that, uh, is, there, is there a question maybe or no? There's not, not so far. Okay, um, the curve counts a little bit different than usual. And so, so what we are going to do is we are going to count uh, not quite all curves as usual, but what we call bare curves. So in general, these curves are maps of uh, Riemann surfaces and Riemann surfaces may be nodal and it's a sort of complicated uh, space of such curves. But we are requiring that the curves that we count, they actually are what we call bare, which means that all their, uh, all their components have positive symplectic area. So if you do ordinary holomorphic curves, then you can take a holomorphic curve, you can attach any constant map of any other curve to it, right? But we somehow require that our curves do not have any of these constant components. And th th that will take some work to make sense of, to, out of and so on, but for now, just state it like that. And so, so the scale value curve counts are based on counting these bare holomorphic curves, and we count them by their boundary in their frame scheme. So we need to explain the boundary, of course, generically <clears throat> should be an embedded curve, but we need to say something about this framing business. And so let, let, me, let me describe that. So we, we get the framing by adding some data to the problem. So basically we pick a vector field along the Lagrangian three manifold, and let's maybe for simplicity take it to be non-vanishing, in, in fact, kind of generic would be enough. And then we pick a four chain, which has boundary twice this Lagrangian. So for all the Lagrangians that we consider, there are such four chains. And it's not as, in the cases when we have these open manifolds, it's not as restrictive as this sounds. So for example, the zero section in S3 has such a four chain with just a graph of any vector field. 
so somehow it's it's not it doesn't mean that l bounds it bounds as whatever no, comp, uh, i guess borel more or whatever borel more and more okay um and, but but we have a local requirement of this four chain near l and that's that it starts out like uh j times this fixed vector field so there's some of these vector fields you can multiply it by j it now sticks out of the lagrangian and you you demand that your four chain starts out along that direction positively and negatively so so kind of that means that the boundary is twice l in the end and this twice is actually necessary we'll see we'll see uh, in a bit but for now this will allow us to um, define a linking number between L, the Lagrangian, which is three dimensional and any holomorphic curve with boundary on L. So of course, such linking number, not so well defined because the, the, the boundaries of, of the two dimensional thing and the three dimensional thing actually intersect. So, so it's, it's right, hard to define linking number, but if the boundary is transverse, uh, Everywhere or, or nowhere in the uh, nowhere linearly dependent with this vector field psi, then uh, we can do the following. So, so the psi and the tangent to the boundary defines a plane. We can take the normal to that plane, multiply it by j. So we get the vector field that sticks out of L, and in particular sticks out in a direction perpendicular to j times psi, right? And then we push the a neighborhood of the boundary of the curve along that vector field. So now we have we have a two uh, two chain which is the curve with push boundary, and we have a four chain which is this chain C, and they intersect in some points, and that's the linking number. So so it sort of depends on how we shifted it off. It depends maybe on psi, but this is what we define to be the link. Okay, and uh, oops, now it works. So now, and, and now the, the skein valued curve count uh, is a count with, where, where we count in, in Roman Witten theory, sometimes we want to count connected curves, but we actually count disconnected curves. It means that we are going in to action after exponentiation in, in, in the usual story, but, we, but, but for now we just count all disconnected pair curves. And the contribution of one such curve is the following. So, so it's first some weight, which is just the, this uh, weight of this point as a, you know, as a, as a serum orbifold, whatever. So it's some rational number. Um, but you know, if, you, if you see one actual curve, it will be plus or minus one. And then the interesting stuff. So, so there is this C parameter. Remember Z was one of the parameters in the Hornfli polynomial. And we raise it to the negative of the Euler characteristic of the curve. So that's, that's Z. And then we, we take the A, A, the other variable in the home free, and we raise it to the linking number between L and our curve U. And finally, we have this frame boundary, which is the curve, which is not uh, nowhere parallel to Xi. And we take its value in the skein of the, of the Lagrange. So somehow, you know, what we get is a huge sum of uh, of elements in the skein. So the, and then this total element in the skein is is the skein valued gamma with an invariant. Um, okay. So the, the the key point, of course, in defining this is is that this is actually invariant under deformation. So what we have to fight with are all these crossings of boundaries and other things. And, and, and that one needs to, uh, to prove, of course, and, and the proof of that is basically the construction of a suitable perturbation scheme uh, for this kosher riemann equation. And, and, uh, and it's a slightly long story, so we decided to develop these things in using language of polyfolds, but I'm, I'm gonna try to explain somehow the kind of key new idea when, when, when you, when you count curves like that. So, so uh, if we start here on the, on the top left of this picture, we see a typical nodal curve uh, with boundary and it, it, it uh, maps, we take it to map into J 
just local symplectic space R6 with boundary on, on, on R3. So that's a, that's a, you can describe by the standard sort of polyfold methods and so on. But note that these, um, since we're in local R3 and we're counting stable maps, all maps we see here needs to have stable domains, right? There is no map of symplectic area, something, something. So, so somehow it's, a, it's an unusually simple space. And, and this space will, we will use at the constant components later on. So there is, there is sort of one uh, important, uh, important observation here is that we take, if we take such a map, it typically in this function analytics setup, you describe the topology on the space of maps by using weighted norms, weighted Sobler norms. And so we, here we kind of doing something seemingly strange looking. So we take the usual Sobolev norm and we just weight it by some number, which I write like e to the two row or e to the row zero, okay? But one important thing to note is it's kind of stupid, but, but, but we're using it. So if you start with a function on this domain and then you scale it down so that it looks reasonably big in this weighted norm. So you have to multiply it by a very small number. Then you take the usual D bar operator and, <clears throat> uh, and then you sort of weight it back. You take the norm in, the, in, the, in this new weighted norm, right? Then of course, as you, as, you, as you take the limit as rho goes to infinity, then this just goes to the standard D bar operator somehow independent at, at the origin, right? So somehow. And, and so in some sense, what, what we're observing is that if you, if you do this thing, you, you basically go to the linearization of the D bar on that domain. And now you can describe the configuration space for these bare maps. Uh, we call them bare maps with ghosts. So on the left there, you see some sort of, uh, in, in now in, in, in some actual ambient space X, you have two non-constant curves, the torus on the left and the disc on the right in, in Z sub X. And in the middle sits a ghost bubble, so a constant torus sitting at the node. And the way we deal with it is we, we enforce the map on that torus to be actually constant. But we somehow keep this tangent space of, of, of the Rn polyfold at the, at the origin and the linearized operator at the origin over that component. And that means that um, you know where you go when you open the curve up. So when you open the curve up, you know, you have some gluing parameters, it's indicated on the right, and we're weighting the vector fields on the, on the middle piece by this huge weight, which is the minimum e to the minimum of the gluing parameters. So as the gluing parameter goes to infinity, the weight goes to infinity and the map is basically forced to be constant. But the good thing of keeping this tangent space is that things like the Debar operator behaves in a, in a continuous way as you, go, as you go to the limit, right? So somehow it's not that we just force it to be constant. So the only solutions to the Debar at, at this extra ghost thing is the constants and it's sort of in, working in a continuous way. So, so then you can use uh, many of the standard um, standard things developed for polyfolds and we have a little bit of extra fast cutoff for perturbations, um, but this is sort of the setup. Um, and so Tobias, can I ask just one more yes. time to make sure I understand? Sure. So, so somehow you are recording more information when a ghost bubble develops? Yeah, I'm, I'm the recording, point? that's right. I'm recording basically all of its so uh, in practice, what we're recording is all of the topology of the ghost bubble sinking in there. Um, uh -huh. but, but, but the main point is, you know, when you do the, all these polyfolds, uh, before the limit, before I, I, I kind of sink completely in, I have a D bar operator, uh, which somehow works over the space uh, as a section. Mm -hmm. and, and now when I go to the limit, when I have the constant there, it would be a disaster if all of the vector fields along this sinking away thing 
would disappear. I wouldn't be a continuous at all. I just throw out the, an infinite dimensional component of this space, right? But I somehow retain that space by saying, declaring that in the limit sits the tangent space. Uh, at the point. At the point. And, and, and the good thing is that when, I, when I'm at the point, whatever curve I have, I have only the constant solutions, right? So, okay, so last question. So, so I can imagine that this is some kind of like jet convergence and not just. Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it's a kind of, it's some kind of blow up. And mm -hmm. I, I cannot uh, tell you exactly, but it's, it's sort of blowing up the polyfold at these points where, where things are, are going constant. Thank you. I think there were more questions. Please, please just uh, ask questions. Okay, so um, so so let let me now describe uh, what goes into somehow the proof of this uh, perturbation scheme. So so the way we do it is we we work now inductively in Euler characteristics. So if you have a bare curve and you you fix the area, then every component costs some area. So you have a, for free a bound. On the Euler characteristics. So the worst you can get is some number of disks or whatever it is, right? And so you start from there and you perturb and, and you get the solutions that are somehow transversely cut out their embeddings and the, the, the boundaries embedded in some sort of by standard argument. But now comes somehow this slightly non standard part of the argument that now we want to go on and we want to uh, describe the next Euler characteristic, which means that. You somehow have to uh, go up, up in all characteristic in the space, but in that space there is a locus of nodal curves now with constants and, and so on. And of course, the horror scenario would be that some sequence of bare solutions converges to a solution with uh, with the constant attached. And what we prove there uh, is that such bubbling off is actually co-dimension two. So the way we, we do it is somehow you take this solution, uh, family of solutions, and you go to the limit. And at the limit, you basically use some kind of um, riemann hurwitz theorem on the curve that you zoom into. And if you think, if some topology sinks in, it's visible in terms of the kind of rotation number of the curve at, at infinity, which is visible in, in a singularity of the curve that you had before either singularity or triple point or whatever. And in this case that we have these uh, bear curves with ghosts, then there are some forgetful maps and so on. So we can make sure that that didn't happen uh, in earlier steps. So, so what happens is that this is some kind of co-dimension two phenomenon and we don't have to, uh, as with the, as with the other curve count, we don't have to care, care about it. And finally, somehow, this uh, can, can I ask one question? So sure. this is called dimension two because they are embedded, right? I mean, uh, 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 because the the curve, your work, the spare curves are ge are generically embedded, right? That's, that's right. That's right. That's two. right. If they were so not basically embedded, right. the the worst the worst right. thing that can happen, uh, the first thing something happens, is the case uh, drawn in this picture, where where you have a singularity on the boundary, the derivative vanishes at one point in the boundary. So that, that's a co dimension two. Um, okay, thanks. So the, yeah. Um, that's right. So, so then uh, once we have this, so, so we want to look at these uh, degeneracies that, degeneracies that still can happen in one parameter families. So, and here they are on the left is a, somehow for open curves. So we can have in the top picture, there is a nodal curve in the middle or in fact, because we have these forgetful maps, you can think of it two ways. On one hand, as a nodal curve, uh, where, where somehow something develops a node, and also as a crossing in uh, of a curve of Euler characteristic uh, one higher. And uh, so, if we try to count in these families separately, so on on the on the top top level, of course, it would be just invariant to just cross through. It would be maybe invariant in the skein, but the curve would be invariant. 
but somehow you see this birth of the new curve on the on the second branch, and that that's never invariant. So, but if you see, if we identify these moments as we can now do, we can make the curve count invariant by demanding that the change in the upper family is equal to that of the lower family, and and so you see that if we demand the overcrossing minus undercrossing is equal to Euler char characteristic times the resolution, um, then then we actually we actually have an invariant count. And this is exactly the skein relation. And, and, and likewise, there is a sort of elliptic version of this where an interior point on, on a curve family hits the Lagrangian, changing the linking numbers. So that's the first thing. But at the same time, you can open the curve up and form a little circle. So in this theory, this normalization of the unknot is, is actually a calculation, right? So, but, but of course, it's also needed for invariance. So if I, if I skip to the right-hand side, then it's sort of the same pictures, but for real curves. And, and the thing we need to remember for real curves is that whatever used to be you know, two pieces, there are two companion pieces of those pieces that you can also choose to glue. And, uh, and so, so what happens is that the, the, uh, well, the skein relations work the same, more or less. It's relating uh, some high, uh, high oily characteristic to one less oily characteristic in both cases. But the important thing that I want you to, so, so that's completely analogous. But note that there is also here a, a, an option not to relate these two things, right? Because in this case, there is no, no moduli space completely disappears. So you see that here the calculation, the count would also make sense, uh, oily characteristic by oily characteristic. There is no breaking in this, in this formula, right? So, so, and that's why this uh, uh, real Gromer-Witten theory makes sense. So, so uh, this would be real Gromer-Witten theory for bare curves, but you can do it also for non-bare curves. So, um, so, so, so uh, let me not say more than that, but anyway, so there, there are two counts there. There's the one that is by the Kaufman skein, and there is the one that would be the usual Gromowitan count. On the left, there is sort of no usual Gromowitan count. Uh, so one has to do something. Okay, and then there is the final uh, degeneracy, which is somehow we demand that our curves be nowhere parallel to this psi, but if you study one parameter families, they could become at some point parallel to the psi. And on the left there is somehow the moment where, where it is parallel to psi. Then because we have a J holomorphic curve, so actually when I should have said that the perturbation, whatever it is, should be zero near the boundary. Um, but we have J holomorphic curve. And so the tangent phase of the curve is tangent to the four chain, which is this, uh, it's going off in, in direction j xi. So when I push through, I, I, I see a new intersection with the four chain, but somehow a kink in the picture disappeared. And checking signs, we see that uh, this is exactly the last um, relation in the frame scheme. So, so, so somehow the price we pay for, for, for killing a, a kink is exactly one four chain intersection of positive and negative signs. And we also see in this picture why it is essential that we have two copies of this four chain nearby the <laughs> nearby the Lagrangian, because otherwise one of the kings you know wouldn't land uh, correspond to any intersection. Okay. So uh, so so that's somehow the proof of this invariance that first we show that it, it's possible to keep the constants constant and then we just identify what happens in one parameter family. Okay, so, so let me comment some on what makes this slightly different than, than usual curve count. So the, the point is that our count is inductive and oily characteristic only. And so, so in some sense, uh, we fix the area and we go oily characteristic upwards. And then usual perturbative treatment is not quite like that. So, so here is some kind of picture of why. So, Imagine that you start with the stable curve like on the left. So it's some kind of um, annulus and it has positive area. And in, some, in the limit, when we deform things, it could be that the, uh, at the boundary, an annulus breaks off. 
So we have a disk with, with, with positive area, we have an annulus and they form a node. And then we try to forget this, this nodal point and then we would like to see the annulus there from already earlier step. But we cannot because the, that annulus now becomes unstable. So in this space, we have to forget the whole thing. So that means that if we set this up perturbatively, um, this configuration uh, of the nodal curve it somehow has to be treated anew all the time. We cannot somehow fall back on what we did before um, as, as we can with the bare curves. Um, so so it's, it's, it's a sort of slightly um, uh, different way of, of, of counting in that way. So, 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 so somehow resolving this problem is the, the key to having this relation. So, and then the next comment is that our curve count can be related to, um, to standard curve counts. And in particular, there is this sort of gupa kumarafa formula, which, which I wrote here. It's somehow the idea is that you have a curve of Euler characteristic uh, chi that lies in some homology class X. And it's an embedded curve and has a nice normal bundle. Then we would like to see how, the, how does it actually contribute to the count? Well, there is this famous formula that says that it contributes like stated. And, and, and here the degree D term uh, corresponds to the default cover of this curve. And you see that our counting is, the bare curve counting is treating every curve like the first term in this uh, sequence, right? So it's somehow like the, the, the simple curve. So the simple curve here contributes X over one, times Q minus Q to the mi minus one to the power of the characteristic. So, so that, that's somehow the con contributions from constant curve attached and there are no multiple covers. And that, that's somehow intuitively how, how our perturbation scheme works. If you start from some curve, there may be many multiple covers, we perturb them out, make them all embedded and then constants are attached after that in some sense. But, but we never perturb the constants. Okay, so uh, the first application of this, and I'm gonna go over that, uh, that's somehow the, some proof of this Guriva for large end duality. So, so here is a, it's a, some kind of a relation between knot theory and holomorphic curves. So we start with a knot in, in S3, and we take its co-normal. So that's the, all the cotangent vectors perpendicular to the knot. It's a Lagrangian in the cotangent bundle. Now we can shift we can shift this uh, Lagrangian off of the zero section by shifting it along d theta, kind of small closed form in the neighborhood of the knot. Um, and then it's off of the zero section and, and then we can move it into the resolved conifold. So resolved conifold is <clears throat> obtained by taking a cone, the quad quadric cone and thinking of T star S3 as one resolution and resolved conifold the other resolution. So, but basically the idea is that out at infinity, these spaces are asymptotically the same <clears throat> as symplectic space. And then this famous Uguriva for large and duality says that in fact, the partition function counting holomorphic curves on this not conormal uh, in the resolved conifold is equal to the symmetrically colored Homfli polynomials of the not um, where, where the color is related to the homological degree of how they wrap around this LK. So let me uh, sketch the proof of this here for the ones, for the curves to go once around and I'm a little bit um, sloppy here. So, so I'm, I'm gonna assume that you can do that by some stretching to make sure that the curves are ending on almost the same curve in LK, but, but the, the important thing here is sort of the, the argument. So if we take a very small shift as in the upper right corner here, then it's easy by elementary means to show that the only holomorphic curves there are between stretching between LK and S3 are the standard annuli. So if we look at curves going once around the generator of, of the homology of LK, it's just one embedded annulus sitting there. Okay, so, so we count, count curves in this homology class. We count them in the skein, then it should be invariant. 
And what is the count? Well, the count is just the uh, whatever Euler characteristic of this guy, which is zero, so z to the zero times the home flee of the boundary in S3, which is just the home flee of the knot itself. Okay, so that, 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 that's, that's our stupid count, but the count should be invariant. So we now uh, deform the complex structure by SFT stretching. So as in the, in the lower picture there, we take some kind of tiny neighborhood of S3, much, much smaller than the shift. And we now stretch the neck over there. So when we stretch, stretch the neck, then it, kind of SFT compactness tells us what happens to the curve. So the curves has to go to several level curves uh, that are joined at ray orbits. But in this case, we're on S3 and S3 is the only simply connected three manifold, but it has a metric, round metric where, where all the ray orbits have index two, which means that the curve on the outside, which is some curve starting on LK and then has a lot of holes in it, would have dimension below minus two. And so generically they're not there and cannot appear then as the limit. So, so that means that all the curves that we ever see actually closes off and stretches away from the zero section. And now we, see, we have a curve count of curves in a strange complex structure. Nobody is intersecting the S3. And then we can just put them in the conifold and identify the linking with S3 with the area of the S2 there. And we see that indeed we have the same, the same curve count in the conifold as in S3, T star S3 minus S3. And, and that, that we know is the home fleet by, by the invariance. So, so this is sort of proof of this uh, Kumavata, large and other. You can do the higher end in a similar way. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's, let's now uh, have a look at what, what we actually learn, what, what somehow different in this way of counting curves as compared to when, when we don't do this gain value count. So here is a, I mean, yes, partly conjecture picture, but anyway, so, so imagine that our knot is just a planar unknot. So what we do on the left in the top picture, we start with this uh, Lagrangian conormal, and we shift it off a little bit and we see one annulus. And then as we start stretching, the, the boundary of this annulus, which is on S3, shrinks away and it forms a disk intersecting the L, the Lagrangian S3 at one point, right? But now by this somehow skein argument, at that point, the curve that intersects the uh, Lagrangian needs to be also belonging to another one parameter family of disks that just crosses through at that point. And that's somehow this other red uh, thing shows this family. So we know at first it's only the annulus. So at some magic moment, uh, there has to be birth of this disk family, right? So you see there are two disks, which one, one, one is uh, with a plus sign, one is with a minus sign, and then we, we, we start moving. And when there is this nodal curve, the, the, one of the disks has to cross through the Lagrangian and the, the, the sign of A changes. So, so this has to be somehow the story. And in, in ordinary gromm witten theory, I think uh, we would never see this second moduli space at all because it counts as zero. So the, the key point is that at some point, we stop counting curves in the relative homology, but we start counting them in the complement of, of uh, somehow in T star S3 minus S3 rather than um, the other, uh, other homology. So, so somehow this, this magic moment, I think is, is, is the, the new input from this theory. So the other comment here is about real curves that I, as I mentioned, you can actually count them. And for real curves, you would in this way get some kind of Kaufman count, a Kaufman skein count, uh, keeping track of all these little crossings that we saw up here. So it's basically would be in the stretch case, a count in T star S3 minus S3. Whereas the usual count is not there. Um, it's somehow keeping, you know, and, 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 and for the usual count, in fact, it's easy to see that the count for any knot 
would be just one. It would count this basic cylinder that somehow survives. And that's, that's all there is. So because in the, for real curves, you actually have a definition of wrong written invariance. You can compare somehow the information content in these two theories. So in some sense, if you take the ordinary wrong written theory and you pass to the conifold, well, you wouldn't get the right curve count. So you need somehow input from this four chain to, to, to get that. Um, okay. So uh, now I, I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to tell you some story about how you can actually use this scan perspective to concretely compute things. And I would like to illustrate it with uh, just the toric brain in, in complex tree space. Uh, but, but before I come to the details here, let, let, me, let me tell you what is somehow the strategy here. So, so imagine you have this uh, X will be actually C, C3 in this case, but it could be this old conifold. And you have a Lagrangian which have the Chandrian ideal boundary. So now if you can look at curves which have, as in the, in the lower left picture there, they have some asymptotic at rave chords of this Lachandrian. And then they could be of dimension one, right? And when you look at the boundary of that moduli space, you have curves traveling to infinity. So that's a somehow a, a or invariant part of the moduli space. And you have all the zero dimensional curves inside because if you think about it, you know, you could split off such a curve. And so basically, if you look at disconnected one dimensional curves and you take the boundary, then you have to have some R invariant T's in there and the rest of the, all the constants. But our argument saying that the, the boundary of this moduli space, you know, should be zero in the scale. So that means that if you, in, if you kind of encode all the curves at infinity, and multiply them in the skein with the curves inside, that's zero. And that very often allows you to tell what are the curves inside from knowledge of the curves at infinity. And the curves at infinity are much, much more simple to, to find than the actual curves inside. So somehow the, the, the message is that the outside determines the inside in, in a nice way. So, so let me, let me carry this out for this uh, toric brain. So, uh, so here, here are formulas for, for this toric brain. So we take, um, uh, maybe, maybe most of you know these formulas, so, so maybe I'll, I'll go over them a little bit quickly, but we, we, take, the, we take C3 with, with, with the three complex coordinates. And then we have this uh, kind of toric geometry projection where we, uh, project to these three real values, the sort of moment map projection. And, uh, and the, the generic fiber over R3 is, is now T2 times R, but at a one dimensional locus, you get uh, S1 times R2. And, um, and these are the Lagrangians, actually one of them only that we're interested in. So uh, the, the standard toric diagram is, is, is down there. And here is a very, very concrete parameterization of this Lagrangian. So um, you have C3, which is the absolute value of the third complex um, coordinate. There is a fixed R1 star, um, which is the circle that survives when you, when you take C3 to, to zero. And then there is a two, <clears throat> there, there are two uh, angular coordinates. Okay, so, so th this is the formula for this uh, Lagrangian. And we see very clearly one holomorphic disk. It's, it's, it's drawn in red there. It's just the holomorphic disk in the second coordinate uh, between radius zero and radius R that ends on this Lagrangian, okay? So in some sense, that's, and that's the only curve there is there, but, but of course all its multiple covers and everything is there. And so, so there is a good source there for holomorphic curves. And, and those we are going to try to find. And the idea is to, to try and understand what is this, what is this uh, Lagrangian at infinity. And if I go back, so you see this R1 parameter, when you take C3 to infinity, is some, uh, just somehow very finite. And so you, it should be, it's asymptotic to this, to this Lagrangian at infinity, which if you 
if you project it to see that it's, it's some Lagrangian, <clears throat> Lagrangian, I should say, in S5, when you project it to CP2, you see what you get. So you actually get the Clifford torus, uh, but not quite um, just simply covered Clifford torus, but it's somehow this uh, uh, lift of it, um, the, the bohr sommerfeld lift of it, so it's a th threefold cover. And and if you know so and and we are like we would like to understand the moduli space of holomorphic curves ending on that on that torus. And so if you know something about curves on the Clifford torus, you would know the answer to what I'm saying. Um, but the way I'm 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 doing it here is a slightly different way. So you can also draw its front and. Uh, Maybe let me not detail this, but it's 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 as you see, it's not a terribly difficult calculation compared to counting all curves of all genus. The, the answer is that there are three disks, there are nobody else, and the boundaries of these three disks are drawn on this picture of the torus. So there's you see there are there are there's a rape chord, uh, which is the only one of index one, which is interesting. There are three curves. There is a green one, which is basically like a small circle. If you close it up. There is a meridian and there is a longitude and that's it. So there are three disks and they look like that at infinity. But now we use this fact that in the skein, those three curves, the sum of them acting on the full bromov witten count in the skein of curves inside needs to be zero. So that gives us the following equation. So, so if you take this skein valued curve count psi, and you act by this operator in the scheme. Acting just means put from outside, then you get zero. Well, uh, this is a kind of a great equation because these, these operators, uh, you can solve this equation. That's, that's <laughs> and the solution is written here. But, but the point is that from these three very simple curves, you can actually figure out what is the psi. And this psi uh, can be expressed in terms of uh, certain eigenvectors of this operator. It's very concrete curves in the in the skein, times some some q valued function. So th this is a uh, uh, formula, in some sense known from this um, topological vertex. Uh, if you translate, it it agrees with that. Uh, but anyway, th th this somehow uh, a slightly different derivation. We just do something at infinity, and you immediately get this formula somehow. The solution is interesting, but I would say that the, the equation itself, this, this recursion relation is even maybe better packaged than the solution. Okay, so, so this, this equation also has uh, some kind of uh, concrete interpretation in the sense that these uh, curves on the left-hand side, they're actually relative. So they, they ended up at some rave chord endpoint. So that means that whenever you see a disk, so somehow this fat red line there, whenever you see a, a disc that looks like the disc sitting on the toric brain, and you have some one dimensional moduli space, the blue guy moving through, uh, then the price of, of crossing is to add one strand parallel to the big red mess. So in some sense, we learn that holomorphic curves that come packaged over one basic disc, they behave like this with respect to, to one dimension moduli space crossing them. And, um, and, and that's a, some, sort of, some sort of important lesson. So um, let, me, uh, let me skip over a few things here and go to, um, to using exactly this observation. Um, so, um, this is some other uh, Lagrangian, so I'm skipping that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping to uh, what's called generalized curves. So, so we're gonna use this crossing business to, to try and understand um, what's going on with uh, curves in general. So, so here uh, we, we will uh, use a slightly simpler version of this skein, and we will think of the a not conormal. And here we take uh, a specialization of variables. And so, so we take A equal to Q. And then 
there's an observation that if you just take the boundaries of the curve, project them to their homology class, and then put Q to this to the uh, right or something, self-linking number of, of these curves, then you know the count that is originally scale valued actually makes sense and is invariant on homology level. And and such counts that we see over here, that's uh, what would correspond most closely to uh, what has been dealt with, like open wrong with the invariance before. And so um, our equation in these variables uh, would look like the top equation for the toric brain. So, so the one is the little circle, the e to the x hat is the longitude, e to the p hat is the meridian. And now acting on this wave function, which now just encodes um, just encodes the uh, homology class and the linking um, would be uh, zero. And, and, and so then we get somehow this famous uh, solution. So we, we can just solve for, for, the, uh, for the psi of x. Uh, okay. And now uh, I'm skipping over a few things because I'm running out of time. We can come back maybe later. But uh, one, one of the observations from knot theory is that it actually looks like uh, this Confli comes packaged as a quiver partition function as it's called. And, and, and here there is some kind of geometric explanation of that. So if we imagine that all our holomorphic curves come in these packages that they sit on the Lagrangian conormal as these basic disks, then we can show that in this, in this U1 skein, the contribution is given by, uh, or, or the projection of U1 skein, the, the contribution is given by this quiver partition function. So, um, so in, in other words, uh, if you don't know this partition function, so what you can say is the following, that you take, you take these basic disks and they sit in the S1 times R2, they link in certain ways. So that's somehow these CIJs, they correspond to linking number. And then you write up just a product of the, this solution for the toric brain in non-commutative variables like this. And that is indeed the count of the holomorphic curves on the not conormals. So, so as, as we see here, that we can somehow de determine this homology uh, or generalized curve count by linking numbers between basic disks and self-linking numbers. And so, so, so somehow it's a very small package and that's what, what somehow looks like Gupta Komarafa expression. It's not just the basic curves, the basic disks, but it's also how they link, but that's it. And, um, and, and, and just very quickly here for the unknot, uh, we can see these two basic disks and indeed uh, all the curves, you know, if, if you look at the, the you, have a, you have the answer because we know that the colored home free is the answer. So, so you can check that the, the, the contribution from these disks indeed correct uh, as predicted by the, by the home free. And then uh, it turns out that if you look at other nodes, uh, they also have nice uh, quiver uh, descriptions like that. So, for example, for the trefoil, uh, there are six. There are six basic disks with certain numbers of a's in them and q's in them that generate all the colored uh, homely of the of the of the trefoil. And um, and and in kind of all nice examples, in in all examples checked, in fact, it's like that. And uh, the the uh, combinatorics works out. So one could then ask about uniqueness of this, uh, you know, basic disk expression of the partition function. And it turns out that it's not unique. And uh, there were, in particular, in the knot theory community, found various quivers that gave the same partition function. And and it, it seems that there are there are two main sources for this. One is a canceling pair of disks. So one disk um, that uh, differs from another by one twist on the boundary and one four chain intersection. 
and doesn't link with everybody else the same as the first is they actually cancel in the partition function. So they, there is a somehow this should be thought of as a birth death in some sense. And then there is a there is a crossing story where you cross through and um, two basic disks becomes three basic disks and, and, and somehow with, with linking information. But the hope is that these are the only uh, the more or less the, the only the pieces from of non uniqueness and in fact in dealing with these things we have some kind of conjecture about what this should look like in general for any not and not conormal and that, that's a smaller collection of, of disks and then you use this crossing move with two basic disks and you get it so for example for the trefoil you should actually start from two disks and you produce six disks by one standard little disk, so kind of unknot disk, and one other disk that you cross through, and then you get, get this. Figure. And this is related to a lot of things like hopefully uh, homology, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I'll, I'll stop here and, and take questions. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Tobias. Questions? Um, may I ask? Sure. Oh yeah. So so you have this uh, basic holomorphic disk. So so should we think them as like an open VPS invariant? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. So uh, um, yeah. So may, but. May... Yep. Yeah, so the formula, but I wonder if in your setup, do you see any like higher genus open VPS or you only see uh, basic disks? So th that's a, a great question. So you basically see in the formulas when you write partition functions, you see only basic, basic disks. So they are all disks, it seems. But uh, if you have, you know, you move your Lagrangian to some setting where you would have a basic, you have an embedded torus or something like that. Mm -hmm. You can basically say how that would be expressed in terms of the, of the basic disk. So I, I'm a little bit short on, I was a little bit short on time, but, but one key to this, which, which I think one should look much more closely into, and I didn't, but it's this, this relation where you cross things through. So, so what it's saying is that if you have two basic disks and you move one through the other, then you create a new kind of equivalent description with three basic disks, just like in this case. If you had some higher genus in one of them, so one of them was an annulus or a torus or something, this is no longer true that you cross through naively would expect that you know you, you create, you have a disk, you have a punctured torus and you have a new punctured torus. But that does not match. So in order to understand what's going on, you have to first re-express the torus in terms of basic disk, do the, all the crossing, and then kind of <laughs> go back. So it's, it's something, I, I don't know if it's geometrically true that they're always disks, but if there are higher genus curves, you sort of have to go to the boundary in their moduli space to understand crossing formulas, to understand how they completely uh, contribute in the partition function. But, but this is something I, I'm trying to understand, but I, I think it would be great if somebody like you would go in and, and actually do the, you know, the obstruction bundle calculations at the nodal curves, right? I think that would be extremely interesting. Um, I, I don't know, I could maybe not do it, but I think that is a really important information. Thank you. I also have a question. So let's see, um, the way you count these bare curves, it seems to me like, um, uh, how should I say it? You basically look at the bare curve and its contribution, as you said, it's this degree one contribution. So it's as if you would write like a Gopakuma Vafa type of formula, but just with the degree one, right? I mean, not, Correct, not yes. with the sum of all the things. Yes, right? yes, yes. So you're just kind of filling off just a degree one. So I wonder if uh, in fact, these things which are disks are, are of the same, I mean, perhaps, perhaps what happens is that you know, there is this full Gopakumovafa conjecture where yeah. it's sort of, it's, you know, it's, it's as if everybody would be disks, right? That, so that's I right. wonder that, if, if in fact, 
I mean, there is this, this difference between what you call basic disks yes. and BPS states, right? I mean, we're going to be yeah. bell curves and BPS states, right? I mean, somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Two I different mean, changes bear, bear, of variables. Yeah, so, so what, what I would like to say is something like that, that the, the BPS state or generator uh, should be one of these basic disks. And, and what, what data goes into it is kind of your style multiple cover formula. Right, I see. Plus mm -hmm. the information of the link that sits oh. at the boundary when you would perturb it out. Right, right. And that, so that link, right. yeah. mm -hmm. contribution. And that, that, li that link that, would yeah. be exactly this link that we, we computed with the recursion from infinity. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so it's some sort of multiple cover contribution. Well, I haven't done that, but somebody would have to exactly. calculate exactly. multiple so, cover so the contribution idea is that, with this sort of uh, framing yeah. at the boundary, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, that's only, right. Only so, so, and, and so it's a, directly at the boundary, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so well, somehow, Melissa, Melissa, Melissa could do it probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? no, I, yeah, I, I think somehow all, all, all ingredients are there. Uh, and so we know what should be the basic things. And now one would need to prove that you know that's all there is, uh, or, or some some way maybe like you did it in, in the closed case, to show that somehow for some perturbation these are all the curves. And maybe one one other question prompted by your uh, observe or by your comment, which maybe I misunderstood. Uh, you know, at some point you said you count bear curves, and then you made this comment about uh, you know putting all the genera together or something. You know, yeah. in the perturbative theory. So I'm wondering if you need a sort of a, a compactness without a prior genus bound. Uh, in your count for bear curves, because you seem to lose the genus or not, or you keep the genus maybe when you do the Fred Holmes theory, but then somehow eventually you lose the genus and you need some compactness result. No, no, no. I, I, I'm somehow doing the the compactness. The compactness result is the usual compactness result. So I see, like normal compactness, right? Okay. Yeah, normal compactness. I see. But but the point is that it's somehow I'm mixing compactness with transversality for these bear curves and forgetful maps in some sense. So that if something sinks in, then it's always visible as a singularity of a curve con constructed earlier. Right. So it almost seems to me like you're counting images, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's really. right. So, so <laughs> really, de facto. But, 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 but it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. So mm. it's sort of important. So for example, um, if you take, if you in some situation, we have one curve in, you know, it's sitting there. Of course, in usual gromo witten theory, you could take twice this curve. You know, take it. Right, right. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay, that. yeah, no, but that's, that yeah. would not be a bear curve, right, in your language. That's not a bear yes. curve. And, right. But in our story, we somehow have to treat, it's a different domain. So we treat two copies of that curve completely on new footing. Right? Sure, sure, okay. So the dis disconnected curves has nothing to do with connected curves in some sense. So, of course, it's co dimension infinity that for them sitting on top of each other. So, we, we move sure, them apart. Sure. So, there I mean, you go. presumably turn on some, some abstract perturbations, which anyway make, makes everybody embedded, including the curves which are double covered or something, right? Correct. Like, and and the key point is like that, that. For, for these abstract perturbations, normally when you do abstract perturbations, you have transality everywhere. Right. But we have transality except for, you know, constant that, that components because constants somehow, are there. somehow you, that, and, you set it up, right? And so, right. somehow you have to prove that that's the only. Degeneration. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a question about, um, you know, the j just a clarifying question about, you know, the setting of where you're setting these curves on non compact Lagrangians and you're doing the sort of moving from infinity. So, so there you sort of want to define skein valued curve cancel. Can you just, um, I was wondering, just want to clarify what the skein module is in this case. So, so because it looks like the boundaries of some curves, you're allowing some curves that whose boundaries go to go to the boundary of the Lagrangian that aren't closed. Is that right? So, so the 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 actual answer is that you know you would take a, a solid torus, and then you actually do you you use a relative relative skein where you allow the the knots to have actually endpoints at this uh, point, and and of course as modeling holomorphic curves they. They don't go in the crazy way in there, but they go in along some kind of nice. Uh, so, so, so that's that. It's actually a relative skein with two points marked on the boundary where they can end. Okay, thanks. And, and then, and, and that's, oh, kind of a, that's kind of important thing in order for you to use this skeining more uh, locally, so that you don't, if you pass through, you don't leave some stuff. Kind of, it's a. 
you know, it, it more Thanks. So that's how this, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just a follow up question. So then, can I think? So so this three manifold with boundary, um, you know, you can look at its boundary and, and you can look at like the skein algebra of that two manifold, which is like you know that's essentially. Um, and so, can I think of this operator equation as you know some equation coming from you define the counts on you know, on the boundary to get an element of the skein algebra that gives you an operator on any module over the skein algebra. And, and this is sort of, can I think about things in yeah. that way? Yeah, Ex exactly okay. that way. That's right. So, so, so the, the curves at infinity gives you that operator that operates on the thing. And, and what, what somehow often the case or what's the case because sometimes you can make it exact is that that operator equation has a somehow unique solution or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, 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 so in this example, I mean, instead of instead of uh, counting all the curves, whatever the kind of home field, you just count three curves, and that's it. So, directly. So, so I, I think it's somehow this explanation of why there is such a recursion relation. Thanks. Yeah. May I ask uh, how much of the not conormal case generalizes to knots in, in general three manifolds? Yeah, that's a, a that's an interesting question. So um, first, it's a little bit different. Um, the point is that um, when you stretch, um, then if you're not S3, there is some fundamental group there. And so there will be some kind of ray orbits. I mean, ray orbits are like geodesics and index of ray orbits are like index of geodesics. So there will be some index zero geodesics there that stay. So, so the curves on the outside, instead of just lifting off, they actually have some ends at these ray orbits. And, uh, and so there will be, except for, for those curves on the outside ending there, there is some kind of universal Grom Witten invariant of that three manifold, which counts the curves with positive ends of these and some kind of uh, boundary on the three manifold. So, so far, uh, we didn't do very much in this direction. I, RP3, we did kind of <laughs> something like that. So, but, but even that is uh, slightly different and interesting. And, and there, the transition would give you something like local P1 times P1, and this extra orbit is the other. Is the other uh, Kähler parameter in some sense with, with an interesting change of coordinates? Um, so, 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 so the general thing uh, generalizes, but in the game is something that we call the universal open row written invariant, which is this counting of curves with positive ends and and uh, knots on the on the, on the zero section. And is there any connection with quiver partition functions in, in that generality? Is there any proposal uh, for? Yeah, I don't know. So, so somehow the close. So, um, how to say? So, uh, there is a e even in ordinary knot theory, there is a kind of a, an interesting case that we're currently working on, and, and, and where I don't really know the answer. So, so e if instead of the knot normal, you take the complement of the knot. That's also some Lagrangian. And if the knot is fibered, then you can push the complement off and you can repeat this story basically, and then you get some quiver. But if the knot is not fibered, then some pieces of the Lagrangian stays inside there. And it's somehow, the first example is this 5-2 knot. And and there is a branch there, which we don't know if it has a query description or not, actually. So it, I, my guess is that it's not maybe exactly quiver, but almost quiver. It's <laughs> slightly different. You have some curves with some extra punctures in them. So multiple cover formula should be slightly different, but, but we don't really know yet is the honest answer. But what I would say, uh, if not quiver formula, it's like, like um, Little bit generalized quiver formula, <laughs> something like that. But, but I don't know which which generalization it is. Thank you. So and and I would guess that for, for three manifolds it's the same. That when you leave stuff, you have almost like S three, but some new pieces. 
and I, I don't know the form of them, but, but I think it should still be somehow orderly manner, not, not crazy. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank Tobias again. Thank you.